morning I talked about uh, options for greenhouse gas emission reduction and the costs of greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is talk about the instruments for greenhouse gas emission. The government has a goal, and the question is how to achieve it. Um, there's many uh, alternative uh, <coughs> ways for a government or a regulator to uh, reach its uh, goals. The most popular one in environmental regulation, uh, definitely but probably in a lot of other uh, areas of public policy as well, is so-called direct regulation. That's the polite term. Uh, the impolite term is command and control. Uh, <clears throat> well, essentially what you do in command and control direct regulation is that the government tells you what to do or what not to do and how to do it or how not to do it. They just, just a mandate, just uh, a standard <coughs> or a rule that tells you um, how to do things. It is the most common form of environment regulation, as I said. Um, it has been highly successful in the past. Uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, the European environment was very, very dirty. Uh, it's now a lot cleaner. And this is because the regulator essentially told factories uh, to change their ways, uh, prescribe how we burn fuel in cars, what sort of engines to use, and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> Because of the past successes, there's two things. One, environmental regulators know that this works, so they have a bias towards this. And a lot of these senior environmental regulators were young people in the 70s when this was very successful. So they also have a personal bias in favor of direct regulation. <clears throat> now, direct regulation works and works well if the regulator knows what is going on. <coughs> so if you have a few large sources, large point sources of emissions, say a few factories that emit uh, a certain substance, uh, let's say sulfur or lead, um, then you can indeed assume or uh, hope that a civil servant would go into those five, six factories, sort out what sort of machinery are they using, how are they using it, and then come up with a way of saying, well, if we change our production process a little bit, then we would avoid all these environmental issues. If that is the case, then direct regulation probably works uh, relatively well. If that is not the case, if you have a large number of uh, diverse and small sources of emissions, then it is much harder to imagine that a civil servant would understand fully um, what needs to be done to clean up these emissions and come up with a rule that does so effectively and efficiently uh, and accurately. And we should keep in mind that the way a democratic process works that the government can only come up with rules that apply to everybody. There cannot be too many exemptions from any policy intervention because that would not be fair. So direct regulations or any government regulation are often one size fits all. One size fits all is fine if we're all the same size, but if we're very diverse, it just doesn't work. Um, So what uh, uh, types of direct regulation are there? Um, there are actually a lot of them, a lot of different types, and then within each type you have many subtypes and many examples. Um, you can regulate the inputs uh, that go into a production or a consumption process. A good example is fuel efficiency. If your car, if your engine of a car is below a certain uh, efficiency, the number of uh, kilometers you would get out, uh, out of a liter of petrol or diesel, uh, then you're not allowed to sell that car on the European market. It's a simple thing. So that's a form of direct regulation. The regulator tells us what to do. 
it's also a good example of why this is not necessarily fair or efficient. So more fuel efficient cars, more fuel efficient engines are more expensive because they need additional gadgets in the engine, they need additional designs, so they are more expensive. At the same time, they save money because of uh, get more miles, uh, more kilometers uh, out, of, out of the liter uh, of petrol. Uh, so they're more expensive while buying, but cheaper to run. So if you apply, uh, apply such a standard, then this is fine for the traveling salesman who does 100,000 kilometers a year, because he would rapidly earn back the additional outlay for the more fuel efficient engine. But it's terribly expensive for the little old lady who only uses a car to go to church once a week. Because she would also be confronted with the additional cost of the more expensive engine, but would hardly drive, so would hardly save on uh, the fuel bill. Which implies that even though you think you have come up with the uniform regulation, and you sort of may think, well, everybody uses the same engine, I apply the same standard to everybody, so this is fair, it is not, because you go to high cost on low users and a low cost on high users. Um, and in the instance of the traveling salesman, you actually avoid a lot of emissions at low cost. In terms of the little old lady, you avoid fuel emissions at high cost. So also the cost per emission avoided is not at all equal across uh, sources. Right? Um, so that is one example of direct regulation. Uh, you can regulate the technology, continuing with uh, the automotive sector. Nowadays, if you don't put that little converter in your car, you're not allowed to put it on the European roads, things like that. Um, you can regulate outputs, either in terms of what do the products look like and what are the characteristics of the product. Uh, and one example there is that if you're selling toys that are meant for children under the age of three, then you're not allowed to use paints and dyes that contain carcinogenic materials because children tend to eat things, regardless of whether they're edible or not. Um, and we simply said, we don't want that. Like, we don't want that kids to get cancer, uh, and therefore we have forbidden uh, these sort of products. Uh, that's a form of direct regulation. Um, you can also regulate the waste uh, of a production process or a consumption process. For instance, there are limits on how much sulfur can come out of the smokestack of a power generating plant. And that is the reason why a lot of the old coal fired power plants in Europe have closed or are in the process of being closed uh, at the moment. <clears throat> you can regulate the timing of certain uh, activities. For instance, at chip hole, you're not allowed to take off after 11 at night. You're also not allowed to land after 11 at night. Um, that is to sort of stop people from having their sleep uh, disturbed. Um, that particular form of regulation is actually not a hard mandate, but it is a fine that is imposed. So if you're flying towards ship hall and you are getting very late, and the plane is full, then chances are you will land, because then the fine will sort of be compared to the alternative for the airline, and that is to fly you all back where you came from and put you up in a hotel. And if there's a lot of people in the plane, then the cost of putting everybody up in a hotel and flying them out the next morning is very high, higher than the fine. Whereas if you are in a small aircraft or a plane with few people in, then the airplane will return to wherever it is allowed to land after we land. Okay. Um, so sometimes these direct regulations don't have quite 
the predicted effect. Another example of that is uh, the city of Athens, where they used to have a large congestion problem, and the authorities thought they are going to solve this in one go. On um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're only going to let in cars whose registration number ends in an even number. And on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we're going to only let in cars whose registration uh, ends in an odd number. And then in one fell swoop, we halved the traffic in, in the city, right? Not quite how it worked with some very inventive people. And what they did, they all got two registration numbers and swapped them every day. So they imposed the real cost. Um, uh, the poor drivers without actually uh, solving the congestion problem at all, right? So sometimes these things have unintended consequences, and if you don't think these through, uh, the regulation may work out differently uh, than what you uh, intended. Um, you can regulate the location of certain things. In nature reserves, very few things are allowed. Um, Whereas outside the nature reserve, much more is allowed, uh, and you can just outright prohibit something. And for instance, uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, you cannot make them, you cannot sell them, you cannot buy them, you cannot own them, and you cannot use them. All of those side activities are illegal. It's a bit redundant to have all of them illegal, uh, but that's uh, what international law says. But it is direct regulation. As I said, usually successful in the past, and uh, not necessarily effective, not necessarily uh, fair, not necessarily efficient. Uh, <clears throat> the other set of instruments, uh, broad class of policy instruments, uh, other than direct regulation, are so-called incentive-based or market-conform. Um, Policy instruments, and there's uh, broadly three of them. And they are taxes and subsidies and tradable permits. Uh, so, what does a tax do? Essentially, you pay a charge or a levy or a penalty on every unit emitted or produced or consumed. Um, the idea is that this incentivizes, if you pay a cost, if you emit something, so you would want to emit less. The idea is that you incentivize people to emit less, but at the same time you give them the choice. You don't have to, you don't tell them to, and you definitely don't prescribe how they're going to produce their emissions. You leave that to the company, you leave that to the household to make the decision how. You just give them an incentive. The reason that uh, environmental taxes come with so many names depends on the what are the political taboo words in a particular country. Right? In some countries, you can say the word tax. In other uh, countries, uh, that would get you hanged. Um, so different countries use different names for these things, but it's all the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> a subsidy works the double opposite. In a subsidy, you reward people for not doing something. No to double negative. Um, so for every ton of emissions avoided, you get a little bit of money from uh, the government, sometimes a lot of money. Uh, I'll get back to the uniform. Uh, change in cost at the margin uh, in a minute. Um, taxes and subsidies work the same way in the short run, and the secret to that is um, the double negative. We are emitting a lot, now they introduce a tax. For every unit that you emit less, you pay less tax. And that means that your profits go up. For a subsidy, if you emit a lot, and now you reduce less, you get more money, and your profits go up. 
So if the tax is the same per ton of the kilo as the subsidy, then that changes your behavior in the same way. In the short. Not in the long run. In the long run, you should look at average costs. Taxes increase the overall cost in a sector because there's money flowing from the sector to the government. Whereas subsidies decrease the cost base in the sector. That is, there's money flowing from the government to you. So that means that the average profitability in a tax uh, sector is lower than the average prob uh, profitability in a subsidized sector. And that means that investment will find its way towards the subsidies away from the taxes. So in the long run, Taxes work the same way as in the short run, but in the short run you, you reduce emissions. In the long run, you discourage investment in the polluting activity. Subsidies encourage emission reduction in the short run, but in the long run, encourage investment in the polluting activity. So the long run and the short run have opposite signs. Um, Obviously, in the short run and in the long run, taxes and subsidies are different uh, distributional consequences as well. In the case of taxation, money flows from the companies to or the households to the government. In the case of subsidies, the money flows the other way around. Right? So there's got of uh, implications and the distributional uh, complications. Tradable permits are the third class of uh, incentive-based uh, instruments. How do tradable permits work? Uh, essentially, um, the government sets an overall target for consumption or production, or in uh, most cases, emissions. Um, and then that overall target is cut into smaller pieces. Say your overall target is 100 million tons of CO2 emitted. Then you change that into 100 million permits to emit one ton. Um, and through some process, you get that to the emitter. So far, this is direct regulation. Essentially, what you say, the overall cap is 100 million, and this company uh, gets 5 million of those, and this company gets 6 million. So far, this is direct regulation. But where tradable permits uh, go a step further is that if com company A says, well, I can have too many of these permits, I don't need them all, it can sell it to company B. Who might say, I stand up to a few permits, I need a few more. And they can just trade amongst themselves uh, or through uh, some sort of exchange mechanism um, to reallocate who is actually doing the actual use of Right? So the government only sets the overall cap. And it's sort of like, it's an initial allocation of emission reductions, but then let the market sort out who actually makes most effort while staying within the um, thing. So that's how tradable permits uh, work in principle. If the market works well, then prices are uniform and everybody pays the same in the market, it's just taxes. Um, Taxes and tradable permits are very similar in the sense that you get an incentive to reduce emissions. If you reduce emissions, you either have to buy fewer permits or you can sell more so you make money. So there is a, a pressure uh, at the margin uh, to reduce your emissions. If the regulator knows the market very well, then the regulator can predict accurately the price of tradable permits. And in that sense, 
there's no difference between taxes and tradable permits because you can just say, well, this is what the price would be, so you might as well use tax, right? Um, but in practice, the regulator would not be able to come up with an accurate prediction of what the market price would be. Um, so tradable permits introduce price uncertainty. You don't know what the cost will be. You do know what the overall cap uh, on emissions will be. Taxes are the opposite. You impose a tax, so you know the price. The regulator sets the price. But unless the regulator knows a whole lot about what is going on in the economy, it cannot accurately predict how emissions would respond. So with taxes, you are certain about the cost to the margin, but you don't know how many emissions will be reduced. So there is an, an asymmetry there, or uh, actually they're, they're, they're each other's mirror. Uh, in uh, a big problem in tradable permits is always um, how do you start a market? So what I said is the government sets an overall target, creates these permits, and then they sort of like transfer to agents in the market, and then they, they, they start uh, trading. But how does the process actually take place? Um, and this is known as the initial allocation of the tradable firm. The most common way of doing so is so-called grandfathering or grandparenting. Um, and essentially what happens there is that the government creates these permits and then gives them for free to the people who currently emit or based on emissions in the recent past. And so the present is of course unobservable. Why is this called grandparenting? Uh, because it's a gift. And it's because it's based on the past. Right? The uh, good thing about grandparenting is that it's uh, politically easy, but essentially what you do is you confirm the status quo. Essentially, what you do is, if you use tradable permits, what you're doing is, you used to be free to emit these things, but now you need a permit. So you're changing things. But then if you just give these permits away for free, nothing really has to change. It's just a bit more bureaucracy, but that's the only thing. Uh, so essentially, you confirm the status quo. So it's politically easy. The big drawback of transparency, two big drawbacks of transparency, one, is that you reward bad behavior in the past. Some companies that already reduced their emissions by a lot in the recent past get a stingy allocation, whereas companies that just emitted a little bit of no tomorrow actually get a large allocation. Right? So it's not fair with regards to past efforts. Uh, another problem with transparency is that you start with giving these things away for free. So in the beginning, there is no market signal. Nobody knows what the price would be because you got them for free. And now all of a sudden, you're supposed to trade these things. No price signal has been shown. Um, so as an alternative to grandparenting, uh, there's optioning. That is, the government creates the permits and sells them to whoever pays the most. Okay, some sort of option. Um, the good thing is that this, the market starts with a price. You know the clearing price of their, the option, so we have a rough idea of the value of these permits. Um, the advantage from the perspective of the government is that it generates revenue, perhaps a lot. The disadvantage from the perspective of companies is that it generates a lot of revenue, right? You know, the profit might come in that, so it generates a lot of opposition. Um, there's other ways of allocating um, permits. They're mostly theoretical. Um, if we think of uh, emissions as an externality, and we think back of uh, Pareto, and what do, do we need to do to restore efficiency in a, in a market with an externality? 
we need to internalize the externality. That is, the polluter needs to pay at the margin, but the victim of the pollution needs to get the compensation. Um, so one way of doing that through tradable permits is to give the permits to those who suffer the consequences from whatever we're trying to avoid. And then if you want to remit, you simply need to buy a permit from whoever is going to be hurt by your emit. So immediately sets up compensation. Uh, a lot of people would see this as fair. In the context of climate change, it's probably a non starter The victims of climate change are the people in Bangladesh, right? They get their country flooded. Uh, the emitters are uh, rich people in the Netherlands who emit a lot. So, if we want to continue our emissions, then we should buy a permit from the Bangladeshis. Of course, they would be very happy uh, with that, but we would be less happy because we would be severely out of pocket. This would generate large transfer of money. It's also extremely complicated to identify who are actually the real victims. And theory would tell you that the allocation of permits should be proportional to their victimhood. So it's not just enough to say you suffer, but you need to exactly quantify by how much, which is a rather difficult task. Um, so other people have suggested that these permits should really be given away on a per capita basis. The basis for that means national law. International law defines the atmosphere as the common property of humankind. That it is, if that is, it's yours and mine. And essentially dumping stuff into the atmosphere changes our property, because it essentially affects our property. So we should be compensated for that. It's our common property. What happened in grandparenting and optioning is that the government says, no, 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 it's not the common property of humankind, so the common property of the citizens in this country. It's mine, right? The government says it's the government rather than the people. Um, and there is a difference between the government and the people in many countries. Um, <clears throat> So one way uh, people uh, have suggested allocating these permits is just give everybody uh, an equal share in the total permits uh, and then let the market uh, ensue uh, from there. It's relatively easy to do, again, we generate large transfers, particularly if you do it at an international scale. Uh, some people think this is fair, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, if you happen to live in Norway, you need a lot of energy because it's cold. You need a lot of energy to uh, heat your house, uh, and the, the country is not very densely populated, so we also need a lot of energy for transport. Whereas if you live, say, in Spain, um, you need less energy, uh, and by giving everybody an equal right, you're essentially punishing the Norwegians for living in Norway. But that is not a decision that they made. It just happened. To be there because their parents and grandparents and great grandparents did. And punishing the current generation of Norwegians for decisions that were made generations ago may be considered unfair. Right? Fairness is always a very difficult uh, concept. Um, <clears throat> does it matter how the uh, permits are allocated? No, by uh, the cost theorem. Um, so if you do a simple cost benefit analysis, um, where in um, red or in brown, I'm not sure, yeah, it shows up more red than brown. We're looking at the marginal costs um, of emission reduction. And on the uh, horizontal axis, uh, we're looking at the quantity of emissions. Uh, so if you don't reduce at all, the first emission reduction is rather uh, cheap, that is why there's a curve. And uh, start low if you look at it from the right, and the further you push down emissions, um, the greater the cost becomes. Um, whereas the marginal benefits of emission reduction are uh, the exact opposite, if there's no emission whatsoever, there's very little damage done, uh, so the additional damage of a little bit of emissions is low, uh, but as emissions go up, uh, you see higher and higher costs. And then the social optimum 
is uh, where too much internal clusters meet. And then we have a quantity Q, uh, the optimal quantity, and the price P, and the optimal uh, price. I always explain uh, the Gauss theorem um, in this context in a situation where you live in a house uh, and somebody who really likes to play the saxophone moves in next door, uh, but unfortunately he cannot really play it. Uh, but he does like to practice. Um, <clears throat> so the green curve are your the measure of your annoyance uh, with the noise, and the brown curve is a measure of his annoyance uh, of not being able to play as much as you want. Right? Um, and then the two of you can form a society, and you would find an optimal amount of uh, saxophone playing as well as an optimal amount of annoyance. Right? right? That's the P and the Q. Um, now, Suppose that the rules in the house that you both live are that you have a right to silence after 10 at night. Uh, but the sex can't play works all day, uh, comes home late and wants to play after 10. So what would happen? Um, the sex can play really wants to play. You really want to sleep or study or whatever uh, you want to do. Um, He's not allowed to play, right? But he can knock on your door and says, uh, what if I give you a little bit of money and you allow me, I give you 10 euros and you allow me to play for 10 minutes? That's a good deal. Life is only 10 minutes, 10 euros is a lot of money. And, and essentially, it's in his interest to compensate you for the pollution, right? And, and if you're somewhere to the left, of the social optimum, then his willingness to compensate you, the brown line, is not greater than your minimum uh, compensation that you need to be equally happy. Right? And as long as you're to the left of the social optimum, you can strike a deal, right? Because the you only need the green bit of compensation, and he is willing to pay the brown bit of uh, compensation, so you can strike a, strike a bargain. Um, so he gives you 10 euros to play 10 minutes, and then he gives you uh, 11 euros to play uh, 11 minutes, right? At a certain point, you start moving further and further to the right, there's more and more noise in the house. But so if you get past the social optimum, and actually, the amount of additional money that you would need for an additional minute of saxophone playing is greater than his willingness to pay to play an additional minute. And at that point, no bargain can be struck anymore. And you stop in the social option and where uh, the money that changes hands for an additional minute is P star and the amount of uh, saxophone playing is Q star. Now, uh, back to the other end. You live in a house where anybody can make as much noise as they want. So it's 11 at night, you want to study or you want to sleep. And the guy is still playing the saxophone. You go and knock on his door real hard because he's playing the saxophone. And you say, I'll give you 10. Uh, you ask him, how long are you planning to play still? He says, in half an hour. You say, I'll give you 10 euros if you play only 20 minutes. Right? And so in this case, you pay him not to play the saxophone. Now, if we're to the left of the social optimum, um, sorry, if we're to the right of the social optimum, you're actually prepared to pay quite a lot to have him pay a little bit less. And he, his lips are getting sore, uh, he's getting frustrated, so he is actually willing to accept only a little bit of money to stop playing now. Right? And that bargaining continues, and you keep moving to the left until you hit the social optimum. 
if you move beyond the social optimum, then the amount that you are prepared to pay, to, for him to pay a minute less, is much less than he would be willing to accept for him to play uh, a minute less. Right? So if you start in that point, <coughs> where there is a right to make it much more what you want, you end up in the social option. You start in the situation where there is a right to silence, you end up in the social optimum and there's such a campaign. And if you start in the starting point with the right to make as much noise as you want, you still end up in the same situation uh, and at the same price. So that's the cause for the fight uh, to uh, bargaining over environmental pollution. Um, the general way of saying it is that both theorem separates efficiency and equity, uh, where efficiency is the final allocation in the market, and equity is the initial allocation uh, of property rights. Uh, you always end up at the same quantity and the same price. Distribution is the difference, right? In one case, you are paying the saxophone player not to play. In the other case, the saxophone player is paying you to play. So the distributional consequences are different. But the amount of saxophone playing and the price of a minute of noise is uh, the same. So it does not matter for the market of tradable permits how you allocate these permits. There is a distributional question that is not a question of what will the eventual price or the eventual amount of emission be. Um, has been Unless the, 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 the and um, like the exercise in the book, right? What happens to the ghost theorem if indeed the redistribution is so severe that you would affect the marginal willingness to pay, right? Or what happens to the ghost theorem if there's loss aversion or things like that, right? There are a large number of fairly strong assumptions behind the ghost theorem. Right? Um, point well taken. Um, so, um, one aim of environmental policy may be to uh, reduce emissions at the lowest possible cost. To economists, this sort of comes natural, right? You want to do something, and why would you pay more than you need to pay? To environmentalists, this sometimes comes uh, a bit unnatural, right? If you define emissions as a sin, then you should be paying as much as you can, right? Rather than as little as you can, uh, but let's um, forget about it for now. Uh, and let's just assume uh, that we have a social planner who has a target for, being, uh, for emission reduction. Uh, and wants to reach that target at the lowest possible cost. That is it. So let's assume that the cost of emission uh, reduction at N, cost is C, emission reduction is N, is a quadratic uh, function. Uh, and that holds for every company N. And that's the equation you see at the top. Now the social planner wants to minimize total cost and wants to minimize the sum. Uh, over the CNs, uh, subject to the constraint that the emission reduction effort of all the companies adds up to the total emission reduction target uh, and no subject. And so if uh, you want to solve this problem, then what you do is you form the Lagrangian, L is the objective function, plus uh, the shadow price times the constraint uh, interpreted as inequality. Right? Uh, so that's uh, lambda. M minus some uh, mn. Lagrangian, and then the first order condition for optimality is that the first partial derivative of the Lagrangian to the thing that you're making decisions over, so that all the m sub n's uh, be equal to zero. And uh, now you see why I assumed uh, that the cost function, right? Uh, so the first partial derivative of uh, C to M is beta uh, plus two gamma uh, M minus lambda. Uh, that's the uh, shadow price of the constraint. Uh, that is uh, linear in this case. That has to equal uh, zero. 
or uh, reworking this, what we find is that the marginal cost of emission reduction is equal to lambda. Now the crucial thing to notice here is that these marginal costs have a substrate N. They are company or country or household specific. The constraint, the shadow size of the constraint, lambda, does not have a substrate. It is a shared constraint for all of society. So the first order condition for cost effectiveness, the first order condition for meeting your share target at the lowest possible cost is that the marginal cost of emission reduction, C sub M, are equal for everybody. Right? Um, this is the social optimum. Now let's uh, do the sums for um, the private optimum, but now one with taxation. So the cost function is, still if you reduce more emissions, you have to pay more. But if you reduce more, you have to pay less tax. And for every ton of emissions you avoid, and uh, you pay less tax to the amount of C. So you need to subtract that from your cost function. Now, this is a private optimization, and it's not uh, constrained. So the first order condition is very simple that the marginal uh, costs uh, is equal to zero. Uh, that's beta plus two gamma mn minus t. It should be equal to zero. Or in other words, the marginal cost of emission reduction for company n should be equal to the uniform tax rate t. And as long as everybody pays the same tax, the costs are uniform. And if we go back to the previous slide, if lambda is t, then we're in the exact same situation. Right? The system of uniform taxation without exemption guarantees cost effectiveness. You meet the target at the lowest possible cost. Uh, ditto for subsidies. Now you get a plus S for every unit you emit. So if you redo the sums, then it's actually the same. You just have to replace the minus T with a plus S. But as long as the subsidy is uniform, you guarantee cost effectiveness. You meet your target at the lowest possible cost. And the same is true for permit. You need to think a little bit harder. Um, if you're a buyer uh, of permits, then you reduce more in-house. You have to buy fewer permits, so your costs fall. So you do minus PN, where P is the price of the permit. That's the same in the situation with taxation, and if P is P, then we're in the uh, same situation. Um, if you're a seller of permits, if you reduce more in-house, you can sell more permits and then of course also your costs fall, so there you should also subtract some of them, right? Um, so this works uh, nice uh, and tidy. Um, so market-based instruments are uh, cost-effective by uh, design because the direct regulation is very hard uh, to meet exactly that condition, and I've alluded to that uh, before. Uh, the environmental effectiveness of market based instruments, uh, as I said before, uh, is of course unpredictable uh, and uh, uncertain. That actually leads us to an ability to make a choice between tradable permits and taxes for a problem like. Uh, climate change. Um, and that choice goes to the Weizmann theorem. Uh, so the Coase theorem was early uh, 60s, the Weizmann theorem was early 70s. Um, Coase is Chicago, Weizmann is Harvard. Um, 
So we again have a simple uh, social cost benefit analysis where it's marginal cost of emission reduction and marginal uh, benefits of emission reduction. And again, we find that the social optimum is to um, either pick the amount of tradable permits Q star, that social optimum, or impose the optimal carbon tax of P star. Right? That's what you would want to do in a social uh, cost benefit analysis. Now, that's not what Weizmann does. Weizmann wonders what if you make a mistake. And the mistake that Weizmann considers is a government that relieves the lobbyists from uh, uh, the corporate sector who claim that emission reduction is much, much more expensive than it is. So the true cost of emission reduction. Uh, the margin of the brown with the brown curve, uh, but the companies have convinced the regulator that it's actually the red curve that they should be doing. Um, now, that changes uh, the amount of regulation that you would take if you go to credible permits. Because you believe it's uh, more expensive than it really is, uh, you essentially allow for more permits in the market than you otherwise would have had, would have had, and you go for under regulation in the sense that Q star, the uh, allocated permits, are larger than Q prime, the true social option. Um, however, if you use a tax instrument, a price instrument, you do it the other way around. So you go a lot harder to reduce emissions, and therefore the tax should be higher to have the desired effect. And in this case, you would go for a price P prime rather than P star. So that would be over regulation. It would be a higher tax. Um, so far, so uh, simple, right? Now, what are the local losses associated with this? Um, in case of uh, tradable permits, in case of a front fee instrument, you over, uh, you under regulate. So you do additional environmental damage, and that's the area under the green curve. Um, but at the same time, you avoid costs to the corporate sector, and that's the area under the brown curve, and the difference between the two is the blue triangle. Alternatively, if you use a price instrument, then uh, you um, over-regulate, so that is an additional cost to the corporate sector, that's the area under the brown curve, um, but at the same time, you uh, do land damage to the environment, but only to the two the area under the green curve, and the difference between the two is the pink triangle. And what you see here is that the blue triangle is graphically almost the exact same size as the pink triangle, but in reality they are really the same size. This is just my clumsy in coloring that suggests they're slightly different sizes. Um, now, what happens if the marginal damage curve is steeper than the marginal cost curve. The green line is steeper than in the previous picture. And in that case, the amount of under-regulation through the quantity instrument shrinks, whereas the amount of over-regulation through the tax grows. And as a result, your pink triangle grows and your blue triangle shrinks. And now, if this is the case, making a mistake with quantity regulation is less of a problem than making a mistake with price regulation. Right? Vice versa, if the marginal damage curve becomes less steep, the blue triangle grows, you over-regulate, under-regulate way too much, 
uh, to the side of the where is your pin triangle straight to me uh, under regulate uh, only a little bit. The mistakes made with quantity instruments are much more costly than the mistakes made with price instruments. Back to the white support did not do this graphically and we did it much more generally uh, than what I uh, just uh, suggested. Uh, but essentially the point here is that if the marginal damage cost curve is less steep than the marginal abatement cost curve, uh, then the stake with price instruments, but the taxes are less costly than the stakes with quantity instruments that is tradable permits. And vice versa, if the cost uh, curve is steeper, then it's the other way around. How does this apply to climate change? Well, if the environmental, the pollution of the environment is a stock variable, if it is with climate change, then we would expect that the impact of this uh, contaminant to be not very sensitive to the exact amount of emission. That's easily fixed in the case of climate change. I mean, the impact of climate change are determined by climate change, and climate change is driven by the emissions of the whole world over centuries or more. So if the Netherlands in the year 2016 does a little bit less or a little bit more, that does not affect the climate, and therefore it does not affect, hardly affect the climate, and therefore it hardly affects the impact of climate change. So your marginal benefit curve is flat. At the same time, if the Netherlands decides to do more about its emissions in 2016, it's going to immediately impose a higher cost on the Dutch economy. And your marginal cost curve is not flat. So for a global problem like climate change, for a long-term problem like climate change, your marginal benefit curve is flat. Your marginal cost curve is steep. And therefore, the Weizmann theorem would tell you, go for taxes rather than tradable permits. Now, Weizmann wrote this in 1974. Like, how can you expect uh, policymakers in 1994 to have read this, right? Uh, the international climate uh, policy has squarely gone for tradable permits uh, against uh, much uh, wisdom. Um, a bit, a bit of a vengeance. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol of 1997 uh, in America, as a four three years later, uh, created possibility for trading emissions within the OECD, and uh, also created the opportunity to jointly implement uh, emission reductions between countries of the OECD and countries of the former Second World, called countries in transition nowadays, uh, whereas the Clean Development Mechanism allows another form of trading between rich countries and very poor countries. Within the European Union, uh, there is the emissions trading system nowadays, which is a default scheme. Um, it covers about 60% of the emissions nowadays, uh, but there is a separate trading mechanism for emissions from aviation. Uh, <coughs> in the um, US, there is a market for tradable permits in the Northeast. Uh, and then there's also a market for tradable permits in California, and I think Quebec may soon join California uh, in this, but it may be confused, confusing Quebec and Ontario. Um, Australia has been talking about introducing uh, a tradable permit system, and depending a little bit on the mood of the day, they changed uh, their opinion. South Korea is supposed to introduce a market for tradable permits uh, later this year. Uh, and China is running several permit, uh, several pilot systems uh, of tradable permits for CO2. <clears throat> now, the condition for cost effectiveness is a uniform price. 
everybody pays the same price fee for their permits. If you have a single market, you have a single price. Here we have nine markets. So sometimes politicians listen a bit too well to economists. Economists tend to say two things. One market is good and two more is better. And they seem to have conflated the two and maybe create more markets for the same thing than somehow that improves up. But it is not the case. We want to be uniform in one market for one good. Right? Um, that seems to have uh, escaped. Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So within these markets, we have cost effectiveness, but not between those markets. Permit markets can be coupled, uh, but let's uh, skip that for the sake of time. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about two practical uh, examples of market tradable permits, the EU ETS uh, and the clean development mechanism. That's the two most uh, uh, developed uh, markets. Just to give you an idea of how difficult this can be in uh, practice. The EU ETS uh, started off in 2005. Uh, it covers uh, about 50% of CO2 emissions in Europe, a little bit of nitrous uh, included uh, as well. Started in 2005, the three year pilot phase. And then it started uh, in 2007, and it's still going uh, strong. EU ETS is so-called midstream trade. <coughs> Various ways of doing this, right? There's a permit for emitting, but who actually holds the permit? And one way of doing it is so-called upstream, where you give the permit to those who take fossil fuels out of the ground or import them into the European Union. The problem with that is that it's too, it's too few companies involved, so you need immediately to start worrying about market power. You know, another alternative is to go downstream, that is, give everybody who uses energy a carbon account. And every time they fill up their car with gasoline or buying electricity, uh, they would surrender part of their permit. Problem with that is you're now talking about 500 million people who would need a carbon account. And you guys are probably pretty capable of, of managing it. But it's still within Europe a lot of people who don't even have a bank account, let alone that they would be able to manage a carbon account uh, on top of uh, so, people opted for mixing, where it is the large combustors who uh, have to burn, and then presumably pass the pump down to uh, the final uh, consumer. With about 10,000 installations uh, initially were covered by the EU. Um, uh, permits for grandparents, uh, you can interpret it as a capital subsidy, basically. Given these permits for free. Uh, the value of these permits is billions of dollars. There are indeed companies in Europe whose main asset on their balance sheet is the amount of permits that they hold. And that is how they finance the operation. There are indeed uh, incidences where companies bought clapped out factories in Romania, not because they wanted the scenery or the land for the buildings, but because they soon came with that with um, <clears throat> Gradually shifting towards optioning, but the transition is uh, not complete, and this is Europe, not guaranteed. Um, Whenever you uh, use tradable permits, you always have an issue with variability and predictability uh, and what to do if. And so suppose that these tradable permits are valid for a year, the year is 2015. Uh, bad example, we have a fairly mild winter. Uh, but suppose that uh, during the summer we have to fight uh, a war with Russia, we use a lot of emissions and then in November, we get hit with a really cold spell and we have to burn a lot of energy uh, to keep our houses warm. 
what would you do if on the 23rd of December you discover that you run out of permits? So the Prime Minister put his head on telly and say, sorry guys, we're going to shut the country down for Christmas. Unlikely, right? You somehow need to have an escape route if emissions are unexpectedly high. And there's actually a lot of natural variability because of weather, because of geopolitics, because of stuff uh, in your use. Um, so there's uh, three solutions to this. Um, one is uh, banking and borrowing, and the school banking and borrowing in the period of 2008 to 2012, as well as in the period of set here, 2013 to 2020. And that is that the emission permits are not valid for 2015, but they're valid for the period 2013 to 2020. And if you ever go over that eight year period, the uncertainty and predictability and variability is a lot less. Right? So that's uh, this problem. And um, on top of that, what you can do is that if you, in 20, period 2013 uh, to 2020, you want to reduce more, you can save these permits for the presumed next commitment period, 2021 to whatever. Right? But you can't do it the other way around. You can't say, I'm going to reduce less and promise after 2020 I will do more. That is not allowed. So it's one way time travel rather than two way time travel. Banking but not borrowing. It's a final escape valve. If you run out of emissions, then fines are imposed. The fines are very hefty. The price uh, of tradable permits at the moment. Um, is around five euros per ton of uh, CO2. The fines are a thousand. So you need to be really, really desperate uh, to want to incur uh, this one. You see a lot of uh, variability uh, in the price. I'm going to talk a little bit about the collapse in price that you see in green towards the left. Uh, what happened there? Well. Uh, the initial allocation of the permits was done not by the European Commission or the European Union, but by the member states. So the, the, the EU ETS covers only 50% of emissions, and the other 50% of emissions are essentially unregulated. And then countries were asked, allocate these, this 50% to your companies. So what do you do, right? You pretend that that 50% really is 51%, 52%, 53%, and you give your companies a little bit more in terms of emission permits. And that means that your companies have a competitive advantage and can sell more of their permits to other member states in the EU. Unfortunately, all the other member states followed exactly the same trade. And everybody over allocated, and then as a result, there was a complete oversupply of permits, uh, and that explained the price collapse uh, that you saw in the previous uh, chart. This better thy neighbor strategy that everybody follows was predicted, but the officials of the European Union said, nah, we don't believe you, they close an eye uh, for these things. Um, CO2 emission permits are not permits on paper. They are electronic permits. Um, and everything is stored electronically with a lot of electrons uh, changing hands. Um, <clears throat> to paraphrase uh, Lenin, uh, if you create a property right, then somebody will try and steal it. Property is theft, right? Um, not quite the Lenin theft, right? Um, and of course, everything being uh, electronic, uh, some jokers or perhaps criminals uh, got in uh, and tried to steal uh, these uh, permits. For some reason, the European Commission did not realize that if you create something that is worth billions of dollars, then somebody will come and buy a theater. It did not uh, properly occur uh, to them. There's also issues with uh, monitoring. Emissions are not real, right? Emissions are not tangible. It's not like you're trading 
uh, a loaf of bread or a barrel of oil. No, what you're trading is a government license. And that means that there has to be somebody in government who is issuing these licenses and making sure that you are indeed following whatever the license permits you to do. Um, Romania had a problem there. The civil servant who was monitoring the emissions in Romania got pregnant, went to maternity leave, and was not in place for a year. And for a year, emissions in Romania were unmonitored. Slovenia, Lithuania, or Slovakia, sorry, and Lithuania have very similar problems, not in school, but this is essentially what they have to there. That's a tough uh, to be required. And that moment you create a hole in your accounting system. Somebody is doing things, but nobody's really paying uh, attention. It leads me to the, the, the final point I want to raise here, and, and that is uh, the system of liability in the EUETFs. There's two systems of liability in any market, uh, the buyer beware and seller beware. If you buy a bunch of oranges in the supermarket, and you say you walk out of the supermarket and you discover that they are rotten, that is your problem. That's buyer beware. And therefore, you should inspect fruit before you pay for it. After you pay for it, it's your problem. If you buy a second hand car, and within two weeks of the purchase, you discover that something is really, really wrong with that car, you can take it back to the seller. Seller beware. If you have a new house built, and within seven years, you discover that something is wrong with the foundations of that house. That's not your problem, that's the builder's problem. That's seller be there. Um, emission permits in Europe are seller beware. That is, if a company in Italy em uh, sells the permits uh, sells its emission permits to a Dutch company, but the Italian company then does not reduce its emissions, and the Dutch company who bought uh, the permit discovers that, then the Dutch company has to call up the Dutch authorities and said, I bought a fraudulent permit. And the Dutch authorities will say, thank you very much for your honesty, you're up to hook. If you accidentally buy something that is fraudulent, that's not your problem. You did it in good faith. Or that is the assumption that you did it in good faith. Right? The Dutch authorities will then call up the uh, Italian authorities and say some one of your companies did something naughty. And the Italian authorities will say, thank you very much. Hang up the phone and go back to sleep. <coughs> we know that Italy has had a convicted court uh, as its prime minister for a long time. We know its legal system is not up to the task of enforcing property rights. But because the system of tradable permits is seller beware, the eventual, the ultimate enforcement of these property rights is done by the member states and essentially the strength of the system is as strong as the weakest legal system in Europe. Now, I picked on Italy. Um, Greece doesn't think anybody, anything about uh, falsifying its GDP to get into the Euro, so why would they not falsify their emission accounts? Organized crime is, has penetrated the governments of Cyprus and Romania. They are the guys who are enforcing our emissions, right? Um, so that is uh, a worrying prospect. That is the reason why the Americans do not want to trade CO2 permits with the Europeans. They simply do not want the Greeks or the Cypriots or the Romanians or the Italians to enforce their markets. 
That's why I walked away uh, from the negotiations with Europe about coupling the various markets across uh, the ocean. I will skip aviation uh, because I won't my thing. Uh, if I do start talking about this, uh, <coughs> two more topics to go, 20 minutes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about clean development mechanism. Essentially what the clean development mechanism allows uh, us to do, emission reduction is cheap in poor countries, it's expensive here, and um, poor countries do not have emission reduction obligations, so you cannot trade in permits because they don't have permits. Uh, instead, you trade in credits. And credits are emission reductions from a deadline. So permits are, you have a total amount of permits, and that's given. But credits are artificial constructs, right? Your emission would have been 100, now they're 90, so you have 10 to sell. But of course, the 100 is not measurable. Um, so they're artificial. Uh, com com the project base. Um, that is, what you do is you go in, you propose a project, you say this project will reduce emissions by so and so much, and that means that I have so and so many uh, credits uh, to sell. In order to do this, there's a whole lot of uh, paperwork uh, that needs to be done because if you're not determined to the permit, immediately balanced by uh, emissions, a credit is something against uh, an unmeasurable counterfactual. Um, so in order to get an approved project, you need uh, to go to the United Nations and then you need the approval of 17 committees before your project uh, is run. Uh, <coughs> as a result, there's always uh, a prize web between ETS uh, permits and CER credits of about one to two uh, euro. Um, this creates all sorts of problems. Some problems at a large scale, some problems uh, at a small scale as far as we know. Uh, the large scale problem um, is given here. Um, that has now stopped. Uh, HFC 23 is industrial gas. You can use it as a refrigerant, uh, but if you sell it as a refrigerant, you get a few dollars uh, for every ton uh, that you sell. Uh, so that's not a very good market. HFCs are also very powerful greenhouse gases. 23,000 times as powerful as CO2. Um, so the carbon value of a ton of HFCs is actually measured in the tens of thousands of dollars rather than the few dollars that you would get if you want to sell it as an industrial gas. So what did some jokers uh, in China do? They built an HFC plant, or anybody with a degree in chemical engineering knows how to build an HFC plant, built an HFC plant, and they said we're going to turn it on and vent all the HFC into the atmosphere unless you buy out our permit. Which, of course, a lot of people were happy to do because it was a cheap source of permit. We could sell it on uh, and upset it against green emission reduction uh, in Europe. But they got their money, took away the plant, rebuilt it in a different location, and said, give us money or return on this plant. And so on. Some people got very, very, very rich uh, about this. It was a big scandal. Uh, at one point, this took uh, 60, 70 percent of the CDM market, more than fake emissions. Uh, from China <coughs> closed uh, this loop. Doesn't mean that all loops are closed. Um, a friend of a friend, he's much smarter than I, he's not a very good student. Uh, we did study together here uh, and we did look at uh, the, uh, the sort of the precursors of all these markets uh, together. As I said, he's much, much smarter than me. He also got a little bit of an inheritance from a friend and uh, another. Um, so what did he do with that money? He went to Indonesia, bought a factory, closed it down. And because he closed down the factory, he could really make hard that he had to use emissions within the compounds of the project uh, product. 
sold the factory, fired all the people, sold the machinery, made a lot of money. We also reduced a lot of emissions, Project Day. So we made even more money. We used that money to buy uh, another factory closer down. And so on. After a while, he got bored. He's now uh, got 100 million euros uh, in his bank account, his personal bank account in India, somewhere in the Caribbean. Um, this is a consequence of emission reductions, the emission credit being project based. So what he did, he, was, he bought up a motorcycle, motorcycle factory, closed them down. He did not change the demand for motorcycles. He just closed down one small supply of motorcycles. So for every supply that he cut, for every emission that he cut, somewhere else a new factory was built up, presumably uh, using the machinery that he just sold and hopefully hiring the people that he had just fired. Emissions haven't bust. Emissions have gone up because of all the relocation that was done. But on the project basis, on the box that they drew around this small factory that was being closed, emissions were reduced. Total emissions in uh, Indonesia did not change. Right? He did make a lot of money. As I said, he was a clever uh, guy. Not the best student, but definitely a very clever. Um, so, there's issues with these uh, markets, right? And if you don't carefully design your policy instruments, then things may go wrong. Final topic, a uh, few minutes left. Um, Technological progress. We talked about it this morning that what matters is not so much what is the price difference between fossil fuels and renewable energy today, but what will be the price difference in the future. And uh, so if somehow we can accelerate technological progress, then we could say uh, a lot of uh, constant emissions. It's not just about developing new things. Uh, okay, this is about uh, developing new things. Uh, what you're looking at, sorry, I was looking at the slide after me. Um, what you're looking at here are two cost projections. One, uh, the emission reduction targets are the same in the right column. Um, there is box standard technological progress. In the other one, there is accelerated technological progress. And the carbon tax that you would need to uh, impose um, by 2050 go from 66 in the standard technological progress case to uh, 35 in the accelerated technological progress uh, case. So that is a big difference, right? And the difference actually gets wider uh, if you look further into the future. Not just future technological change uh, that matters. What you're looking at here is uh, a table of what emissions are uh, on the left-hand side and what emissions would be if the whole of the world would use the same technology that's currently employed in the U.S., uh, that's the middle columns, or if the whole of the world would use the technologies that are currently in use in Japan. Um, now, obviously, if you change from, uh, oh wait, and this is only for China, India, uh, Russia, and Eastern Europe. If China were to adopt the same standards of energy efficiency uh, as the US, uh, then its emissions would fall from 780 to 190. 780-290 and if they were to shift uh, all the way to Japanese technology then it would fall from 190 to 80. So very substantial emission reduction. Right? Um, and if you add up uh, all these things across the world and according to this table the emission reductions would be in the order of 1400 uh, to 1700. Um, Whereas the total emission reductions that were pr proposed in the Kyoto Protocol were only 600. Right? So it's not just about developing new technologies, but it's also about diffusing these technologies 
to widespread use. And China and India and Russia and so on and so forth are simply way behind in the uh, energy technologies that they're using compared to where we are. Um, so that is an important thing to, to keep in mind. It's not just technological development, but it's also diffusion. Um, <coughs> so if we can accelerate technological progress and the, or direct it towards carbon neutral energy, the cost of emission reduction would fall uh, substantially. Should be a bit careful there. Uh, one way, uh, as I said this morning, um, of uh, accelerating technological progress in the energy sector is to take engineers away from computers, take, engineer, uh, take smart people away from medicine, um, and put them to work on energy. That may not be smart. On a cost basis, energy is about 2% of the world economy. The rest of the economy is then 98%. So if we take away technological progress in the 98% of the economy in order to stimulate technological progress in the 2% of the economy, overall economic growth is going to fall, right? So we should be aware that we're accelerating technological progress rather than just redirecting it towards uh, energy. Now, the question is how can this be done? What can uh, governments do? The crucial thing uh, to keep in mind here is that knowledge is essentially a public good. Once you create it, it's very hard to exclude other people from using it. Um, which implies that any rational innovator would under supply public goods, right? You cannot reap the full benefits. Uh, at the same time, R&D is a risky investment. For inventing something, you know the current market, so you think that your invention will sell well under current conditions, but of course by the time your product is at the market, conditions have changed. Or it may be that somebody else had the exact same idea and beat you to the market, right? So R&D is necessarily a risky investment. It's another reason uh, why uh, you would not want to invest uh, a whole lot of money. Uh, <clears throat> because of this undersupply, right, because from a private perspective you would invest less in R&D than you would from a public perspective, you have a justification for government intervention. Now the standard government intervention um, is uh, to use patents. What is a patent? It's a temporary monopoly. You invented something, and in return for the next 20 years, you are the monopolist. You are the only one who can make it and sell it, or if you don't feel like uh, spending your time in a factory, you can license other people to do so, but they have to pay you. And the idea is that the monopoly rents that you reap reward you for the investment in R&D that you make. Right? That is the standard uh, way of rewarding R&D, uh, and actually that is well established, and we don't need to reinvent uh, the wheel here for climate policy. Uh, so that is your most important uh, policy instrument that you have. There's other policy instruments uh, that governments uh, can use. Um, a lot of gov uh, gov uh, governments give subsidies or tax breaks for research and development. Not necessarily effective. Typically, these subsidies reward effort rather than success. We don't reward success, right? We don't want to reward people for trying. No, we want to reward people for succeeding. And that's how we grade uh, exams. We don't give you uh, points for the number of hours that you study. No, we give you points for the answers that you give during the exam. And we reward success. Care less if you're just so brilliant that you didn't need to do anything with them all the right down to them yet. They're going kind to of reward you. Right? Um, there's one problem with RD subsidies. Uh, the other problem with RD subsidies is that they often pick winners. 
sort of uh, some civil servant or some politician or some committee of wise men and the occasional woman um, who say this is the technology of the future we're going to invest uh, all our money in this <coughs> and history shows that civil servants are not very good at predicting future markets and they typically pick losers rather than winners Another way uh, governments can stimulate R&D is through procurement. Government is actually a very large buyer of goods and services. Um, and that means that the government can also say, well, from now on, I'm only going to buy certain types of heating systems or certain types of cars. And by its sheer size as a consumer, it can actually steer the market into particular uh, directions. Again, you run into the problem of the winners, and of course, you should be very careful that what is being rewarded is indeed environmental performance rather than political connections. Uh, um, you can make this procurement uh, conditional. Uh, there's been talk about this uh, in uh, the market for vaccines, where there was a plan to create 100 million. Uh, dollar funds and what that fund would do is buy from the first company that would deliver a malaria vaccine that could be delivered at one dollar a pop uh, in Africa from that particular company we would buy the hundred we would buy a hundred million doses the good thing about such a guarantee is that it takes away the uncertainty about the future market the future market is guaranteed. We don't guarantee who will win it. And if it's an impossible task. Nobody will win it and the money will just sit there. But we do take away the uncertainty about the size of the future market and that we justify uh, the uh, investment. You can also do conditional monopolies where you're going to say that the first company that brings them to the market or <coughs> one year after a company brings them to the market a car that sells for less than 20,000 euros uh, and does 100 miles uh, to the gallon. Uh, a year after that event, that is the fuel efficiency standard and other cars cannot be sold anymore. If that is an impossible target, then it's uh, innocent regulation. If it is possible, then you will see all the car companies scrambling to meet this because the first who is there has a monopoly temporarily, and the last who is there will lose a lot of market share. Right? Um, so that is a way of accelerating technological progress. Uh, another way of accelerating technological progress from the Victorian times is simply to give prizes. And a good example, uh, not from an environmental perspective, uh, but from an effectiveness perspective, uh, are the Atari X uh, particularly for uh, shooting up a rocket uh, into space and letting it return uh, within two weeks, the same rocket. Uh, the first company did, did that won $10 million. Nothing compared to the cost uh, of developing uh, spacecraft, but sort of all the, in, uh, um, uh, all the public attention to this and all the free publicity that it generated and sort of the uh, <coughs> space tourism market that it seemed to kickstart sort of got a lot of companies interested and actually for that 10 million prize about a billion dollars was invested in this technology from a government perspective this is effective and a good way of leveraging um, a lot of private investment <coughs> final thing I want to say here is that <coughs> Essentially, what you're doing in R&D is you're betting on your product selling in 10 years' time. <clears throat> so it is extremely important for a problem like China Exchange that inventors and investors trust that there will be a climate policy in 10 or 20 years' time. And if a government just flip-flops and flip-flops and says, yeah, there's a serious climate problem, we're going to do a lot about it, but then not follow through, uh, as you would see in Europe and the US, 
or even worse in Australia, they're depending on whoever happens to be in government. There is a climate policy or they're not, and then uh, the composition of the coalition changes again, and all of a sudden there is a climate policy, but we replace it. There's no climate policy. <laughs> if that is the situation, if you're an investor or an inventor, do you believe that in 10 years' time, the Australian government will have created a market for your product? No. Right? You do not to believe it. They change their mind every, every three minutes. Um, so, a predictable climate policy is, in fact, extremely important to incentivize inventors and investors to take this seriously and develop the product of the future. Right? Um, and taxes, in that sense, are also better than tradable permits. The price of tradable permits go up uh, and down. There is, of course, this saying in English that there's only two things certain in life, and that is death and tax. So if you have a tax, you have the most powerful lobbyist on your side to keep the tax, namely the finance minister. Uh, and in that sense, tax is also more predictable and more secure than any other policy instrument, and would also help stimulate technological progress. That's all for this week.